Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm Liz, I'm with uh, the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society and um, I'm here with my colleague Brenda. Also, we both uh, work out of the office and um, very pleased tonight to have Stephanie Peterson with us. She's the territory manager in uh, BC and one of our close contacts um, for us at, out of our office. Uh, we're also really pleased to be partnering with uh, Stephanie and the Canadian Canadian Blood Services for our May postcard campaign that we're doing this year. So we're really happy to have them as part of that. Thank you. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, postcards again this May. Um, you'll get five postcards uh, like last year, and we hope that you'll take four of them off and send four of them to people that you know as a way to keep in touch during COVID and also as a way to raise awareness of hereditary hemochromatosis. So that's gonna be coming to you in May. So um, I just want to welcome Stephanie here and thank her for putting together a slide presentation to answer our questions about eligibility, giving blood, and also about booking group blood donations with their online system. So we really hope to amp up our um, group blood donations all across Canada too. So um, over to Stephanie and, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Take Thank you away, so much. Stephanie. Okay. Thank you, Liz. And thanks for inviting me here um, this afternoon or evening, wherever you might be calling in from. Um, so I do have a presentation that I'm going to share with you. And I'll also leave the presentation and go onto our website. If the connection's slow and you aren't following my screen, maybe Liz, I'll ask you just to let me know and I'll go back to the presentation because I can flip through those slides that way. Sure. Okay. So. All right, as Liz mentioned, my name is Stephanie Peterson and I am a territory manager with Canadian Blood Services and I work out of our Vancouver office and serve on the Lower Mainland as well. And I'll just go over a little bit about Canadian Blood Services. So we are a national organization and we were founded in 1998. Um, we operate in every single province except for Quebec. Quebec operates under or has their own blood system there through HEMA Quebec. And we um, not only manage um, the collection and manufacturing and the distribution of blood products, but we also uh, manufacture and collect plasma and distribute that as well. And we also have a stem cell registry. And that is where we ask people who are 17 to 35 to sign up to potentially be a stem cell donor for a patient. And we also work with BC, BC Transplant as well and, um, and other organs and transplant uh, organizations across Canada to help them with their system and to um, provide um, education and awareness about about transplant. So we do a lot a lot of things, not just um, blood collection here at Canadian Blood Services. So before we get started about eligibility and um, blood donation, I thought I'd talk a little bit about COVID nineteen. Um, since COVID-19 has been with us for over a year now, we, we haven't closed our doors. So we have remained open uh, during this entire time. So we've had to make quite a few changes and implement a lot of policies to make sure that we keep donors safe, our staff safe, and our volunteers safe. And we've had to obviously change these as we've learned new things about the virus. So things that are different in our donor centers, if you've visited us, us previously, is we now have wellness screening at uh, the doors when you come in. So we have actually added an employee who does this wellness checkpoint with each person coming in, whether you're a donor, a staff, or a volunteer. And we take your temperature as well um, when you come in. So if you're coming in to donate, it is taken orally. So please refrain from having anything hot, like a hot beverage about 15 minutes before you come inside. We'll also ask those series of questions that most of us are used to answering by now in terms of if you're feeling okay, if you've been exposed to anyone from, with COVID-19 
or if you've traveled anywhere, which I think most of us have stayed close to home, but those questions are asked of each person coming in. We also have a mandatory mask requirement in our donor centers, and we actually provide the mask. So it's a surgical grade mask that we provide to everyone that's coming inside as well. We also enhanced our cleaning. So we have um, hired on additional cleaning staff to come in throughout the donor centers as well as before and after to sanitize each touch point. We also have appointments required now. So before COVID, you used to be able to come in and if we had space available, you could just come in and, and donate if you wanted to. And we call those walk-in appointments, but we've moved away from that. And that is to ensure that we know how many people are coming in to our donor centers and we can manage uh, physical distancing. Um, so you must book an appointment before you come in and I'll go through booking appointments quite extensively today, but um, you can book an appointment on blood.ca. You can also call our one phone number. You can go to our Give Blood app as well. Um, so um, if you've come into our donor centers, you might be familiar with the fact that you're given salty snacks and or cookies, juice, water, coffee. Um, and that is in the refreshment area after you've donated blood. So we've, um, now that masks are required, we ask that people take these snacks and their beverages to go with them. So you can enjoy them either in your vehicle or outside of our donor centers afterwards, just to ensure that you are wearing your mask for the entire time you're inside. We're also limiting entry. So we used to allow people to bring a guest in or someone, a friend or a family member. We also had like birthday parties and large gatherings at some of our donor centers. But again, due to physical distancing and ensuring that we keep our spacing, we are not allowing guests inside our donor centers. Um, and that again is just to ensure that we have enough space for everyone. Hopefully one day we'll get back to that. <laughs> every donation makes uh, a difference. I'm just going to uh, move my little window of all of your images. It's kind of in the middle of my screen right now. So it's kind of in my way. Um, so this slide will just go over various procedures and treatments that um, some donors may have had to have and how many donations they would need on average. So for someone who's going through cancer treatment, um, they could use up to five donations. So that's five donors that would need to help that one person going through cancer. Whereas someone who's going through leukemia, on the other hand, they could require up to eight donations per week through their donation. So they would require quite a lot of blood transfusions in order to get them through their treatment process. And brain surgery is um, only two donations, so a fairly less invasive procedure and only two donors, but still more, more than one person to save that person. Someone who has a blood disorder um, could re require up to four donations per month. And in some cases, this could be someone who will rely on blood donors for the rest of their life. In order to survive, they would need four donations per month. So it's quite a few blood donors that they would need ongoing. And a crash victim, so somebody who's been in a car accident and potentially is um, has bleeding that won't stop, they could require up to 50 donors in order to help them for that one time. So you can see how in that one instance where it would require quite a few blood donors to help them. Heart surgery is uh, five donations. And someone who's having internal bleeding could be about two to eight donations per week. So you can see um, just by illustrating these few treatments and surgeries, there are others as well, of course, um, how many donations we require on an ongoing basis in order to meet our hospital patients' uh, demand and need. And uh, our hospitals, obviously, they never close. They may slow down, which they did during COVID, but we still are shipping out blood to our hospital patients every single day of the year. So that's why we're always asking for donors to come in and we're always looking for new donors. So we're looking for across the country about 112,000 new donors every single year to come in to help us um, meet the need for our hospital patients.
Um, and the next slide I'll go over is some basic eligibility for blood donations. So we do have some requirements for the safety of the blood donors, as well as for the safety of the patient who is receiving your blood at the end of it. Um, so we'll go through this. So tattoos or piercing, this has changed recently, so it might be new news that if you've had a tattoo or piercing, you just have to wait three months until after that for you to come in and donate blood again. If you've been pregnant or had a pregnancy, you have to wait for six months. You have to be 17 years or older to donate blood. So we do have a minimum age requirement. Um, and then in terms of residing in the UK or France. So if you've resided in the UK, France, or um, you have to, sorry, I'm gonna move the slide around again, or Saudi Arabia between 1980 and 1996, unfortunately you cannot donate blood as well as Western Europe from 1980 to 2007. And there is more information on blood.ca regarding this, it gives a bit more specificity, um, as well as our, our nurses at our 1-888 number can answer as well. And the reason for this um, eligibility requirement is due to VJCD, which you may recall as being mad cow disease. Um, Liz was asking me about this call, so I'm not sure if there's anyone on the call might, might be wondering about this one, but this is um, because of VJCD is not detectable until after the person has passed away. We have to be very careful about ensuring that we don't transmit this to our to our patients um, potentially, and so that's kind of why the wide net is cast on people who have resided in these locations with these dates. So moving along, um, you must weigh 110 pounds in order to donate, donate blood, and this is for the safety of the person donating as well. It's not necessarily for the patient, but for, for the donor. If you are going to the dentist, you just have to wait for 24 hours if you've had a cleaning or a filling. If you're having dental surgery, you have to wait for 72 hours after that before you can donate blood. Um, not many of us are traveling right now, I don't think, but if you are, there are a list of locations um, where you would have to wait after you've donated. And this is mostly due to malaria risk areas. So um, there are some parts of Mexico and whatnot that um, can, can cause you to have to wait for a little while after returning in order to donate blood. And again, there's a full list on, on blood.ca of those locations. There's also certain medications that would prohibit you from donating blood too. And there is, again, that full list on, on blood.ca. And then you'll notice at the bottom of the slide, it does list that one triple eight two to donate number. And that's where we have um, RNs available to answer any specific questions you might have about your eligibility. And then the next couple of slides are going over the process for donating blood. So I know I've got a few of you on the call who have already um, come in and, and donated, but we'll revisit that again. Um, so before you donate, you do have to book an appointment, as I mentioned, and uh, we'll go into this a little bit further about doing group appointments as well. Uh, you have to bring identification with you to come in and donate. So it's either government issued ID, or if you've donated and you have a donor card, that is also acceptable um, ID with us as well. And we encourage you to have a good sized meal and plenty of water before you donate, as well as it's been shown that salty snacks um, really help you feeling well, both during your donation as well as after. So we really encourage people to also have that. Um, before COVID-19, we used to offer salty snacks and water as you came into the donor center, but again, because of the mask um, and having you wear a mask, we don't offer that currently. Um, so when you come into our donor center, as I mentioned, you'll go through our wellness check. We'll ask you to be wearing a mask. You'll check in with our, our receptionist for your appointment time. They'll ask you to read a pamphlet and this pamphlet you do have to read every single time that you donate and you will complete a donor questionnaire. You'll go into a screening room with one of our staff members and um, complete the rest of the questionnaire. And then from there, if you're able to, and they say you're eligible, you will go and donate blood. Um, this takes between five and, and 15 minutes, depending on how quickly you bleed. 
Um, some people make a competition out of it. <laughs> they yeah. Fill a bag. Um, and surprisingly, this, this process doesn't take too, too long for most people. And then from from there, after you've donated, we uh, we do ask that you stick around afterwards and make sure that you're feeling okay before you carry on. And we hand you the the cookies and the salty snacks, whatever snacks you want, um, you can take with you and enjoy them outside of our donor centers. All right, so here's the, the tricky technical part. So I'm going to go leave the presentation and go on to blood.ca. And what I'm gonna walk you through is how to create an account online, um, or sorry, how to sign in. I'm not gonna show you how to create it because I'll let you do that on your own with your own personal information. But I'll show you once you've created an account and you've signed in, how you can find the Partners for Life information for Canadian Hemochromatosis Society, and as well as how you can look to see if there's any group appointments in your area and potentially book an appointment. Um, so if I have technical difficulties and you guys aren't following my screen, I'll jump back to this presentation because I have um, created snapshots of all of that process. I just thought it'd be a little bit more, more fun and interactive if I actually walked you through it. So um, this is the homepage of blood.ca for Canadian Blood Services. And just maybe if I could get Liz to give me a thumbs up if you can see this page okay, perfect. So um, when you log on to blood.ca, this is what you'll come to. And to create an account or to sign in, it'll either say sign in or my account here, right beside this red book now. And you can just click here. And I have it so that it recognizes me um, as I log in. So I'm just gonna click log in here. And if you don't, you can just create an account over on this side. Um, and it just asks you um, for your address, your first name, your last name, your donor number, if you have it, your date of birth, your postal code, phone number, and whatnot. So you can just fill out all that information for yourself. And from here, it brings you to your dashboard for yourself. So there's lots of handy things on here that I'll quickly point out. You can see that you're logged in here because it'll show your, your email address. And then down along the side here, there's a number of different features that are really interesting and um, you can poke around at. I'm not gonna spend too much time on here today um, through each of these, but um, there are appointments, there's partners, which I'm gonna go into, donor stats, donation history, there's our eligibility quiz, et cetera. Um, so the one area I'm gonna focus on is the partners area the Partners for Life for Canadian Hematochromatosis. So sorry. Um, so you can go two ways. You can either click on this sideboard here, or you can also use this button here, which is Partners for Life, Join or Manage Organizations. So this is going to be um, where you would go to ensure that if you donate blood, um, that your donation will count towards Canadian Hemochromatosis Society because there is a, a goal that has been set for, for the society, which I'll get into as well. And so I just clicked there um, and I meant to actually leave your group. Um, so when you join in or when you click on here, what you'll do is just start typing Canadian Hemo Toast the Society, and it will auto-populate for you. So you'll see here that there's two, and I would suggest, I need to clean this up, but just select the first one and click on Join the Team. Um, and then once you click on Join the Team, it'll bring you to this page that I already have here, which shows um, the PFL ID number, uh, the name of the organization, and our champion, who is Liz. Um, I clicked on Do Not Allow Contact because I'm, I'm not actually a part of your group. I'm just joining it to show you, but it'll show that you are, uh, if you want to allow contact. Um, if you click on yes to allow contact, all that will mean is that I, that Liz will have your contact information and she'll be able to know that you are a Partners for Life member. So this will bring you to the team overview page and it'll have the, the team name as well as the address as well as the Partners for Life name. Um, or ID number, I should say. And then it'll also have who your team champions. So you'll see Liz and Brenda are listed here as well as their, their email addresses. 
it will tell you um, how long you have been a member. So I just joined today. So it says that I've been joining since March 24th. And then here it'll talk to you about the team progress. So this is where um, the, the goal is um, displayed. So um, the goal that we have worked out with Canadian hemochromatosis is to have 315 donations for this year under your group. So every donation that you make, once you've registered, will populate your team's progress. So you can see already this year, there's already been 64 donations, which is great um, for Canadian hemochromatosis out of the 315. And you can see that I've made zero donations because <laughs> I haven't actually donated for um, this group. And there are 206 team members. So there's quite a few of you as well, which is really neat to see. Um, if you had a blood donation appointment, it would show your appointment information here. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see team appointments. And um, this is for the Victoria Donor Center. So you can see here it says Canadian Blood Services Victoria. And if you're in Victoria and you want to join this group, it's really quite simple. You just, um, and you agree with the date and the time and that works for you, you just click on book. And this will take you to um, the next page. Once it starts, stops thinking. So it will just confirm for you that you are booking an appointment under your team name, Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. And then it will bring you the calendar as well as the times that are available. So as you hover over the times, you'll see this little red two that sh shows up. That means that there's two available appointment times at 1.30. Same thing at 1.40, 1.35, 1.45. And then over here again, you'll see that it's uh, your team name and the information in terms of when the appointments are. And then it'll confirm for you where our donor center is located. So I'll just click through here to show you the next slide, but I won't go too far in order to confirm an appointment because I don't want to Fake a, book a fake appointment with you. <laughs> and then if you scroll down here, you'll say you'll see here it says book now. So it's pretty clear that they you just need to click once more to confirm your actual appointment. And it'll show you a, a Google Maps of where our donor center is located as well. And then on the right hand side as well is the eligibility requirements. You can scroll down and see that it's asking you the, the basic questions in terms of if you can actually donate or not. And you can scroll down all the way to the, the bottom. And then if you still have questions about your eligibility, we do have the full list of all of the requirements that you can click through to as well. So those are the steps for both registering your donation for Canadian hemochromatosis as well as for booking an appointment. So I gave you kind of two things there under one uh, demonstration. Um, as well, I will be, I've already shared these slides with Liz. So if you go back onto blood.ca like I did the first time and you're kind of cross-eyed, not sure where to go, that's exactly what happened to me. I took a snapshot of each single step and they will um, be available to you as well. So you can follow through if you have any questions. And um, if you're going along and you do hit any hiccups, you can always contact Liz or myself and I can get my IT team to help you as well. Um, but it is, it is fairly straightforward once you get in there and start clicking around and, and scrolling. So um, hopefully you don't, have too many problems. Is there any questions on that before I carry on at all? I just have one question um, for the location part of it. Um, so these are held at certain locations at certain times, right? Yes. So the way that we have um, worked it typically is um, Liz has worked with me directly to book groups out of um, Vancouver, out of our Oak Street location. And then she is currently working with different chapter leaders to try and get them to also encourage them to book groups out of our certain donor centers where we have a donation center as well as a chapter leader with Liz. So Liz, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, Carmen, that's a that's a good question. So Bruce is on too, and Bruce is from Victoria, and so 
um, he is uh, doing a group donation. So basically, we are hoping that any of you out there, um, if you are planning to give blood, that you would say, hey, I'm planning to give blood um, on this day, and we can actually make it a group booking. And then when other people go on to book, they could book at the same time. And even though uh, during COVID, we're not really able to, to sit down and have a chat, you know, in Vancouver, when we've done it, we've still been able to go outside and, and be distanced away and, and be able to have a little visit. Okay. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good way for people, especially during COVID to still do a team thing together because um, we do ensure that you stick to your appointment time so people aren't all entering at the same time. It's a really good point that I should have touched on that you do um, enter the donor center at your specific time. But as you go through the process, you'll you'll see your your team members as well. You might be sitting on the bed at the same time and be able to chit chat with them. So it's a good way, as Liz mentioned, to still connect with people. Um, during this time, but safely and, and obviously giving back and donating blood, so. I have a couple of questions. Um, okay. One is uh, relative to eligibility. Okay. Um, there's a good chance that I might uh, end up getting my COVID vaccine just uh, prior to the uh, uh, booking date for uh, the group blood do donation. Hey. In <laughs> I'm happy for you. Yeah, um, and I'm just wondering, uh, would that affect my eligibility? Nope. So there is no wait time after you've had the COVID-19 vaccine, which is really good news. Yeah. Good, good. So you will be good. Right. Good and question, Bruce. Yeah. Very good and timely, because I know many of us will be having that question come up soon. Yeah. The other thing um, is that uh, my uh, son wants to join me, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I... Um, he doesn't have a computer. He just does okay. everything on his phone. Um, yep. Are you able to do all this stuff on your phone? Yep. So if he wants to download the app, um, it's just if he just searches on the app store, give blood, he can do it that way. Or he can right. go on to blood.ca and, and enter in all that stuff on his on his little screen on his phone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, if, if he has a problem with that, could I uh, book for him on my computer? Um, you could. You would just need to know, and I'm sure you would if he's your son, all of his details to create an account for him. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a question. Okay. Uh, you might be going to talk about this later, but um, as of March 31st, the Kelowna Blood Donor Clinic is going to be closing and uh, there will be a plasma clinic, but uh, that doesn't sound like it's very good for someone with hemochromatosis because they give you back all your red blood cells. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering where I could give blood other than the hospital after that date. Um, so I included this slide just for you. Um, oh. <laughs> I knew that question was coming up and I do have a couple more slides to go through too, but we can talk about this right now. So um, as you mentioned, we are transitioning our Kelowna Donor Center from collecting blood to collecting plasma. Um, and you've got the timeline exactly right. So it's only a few more days of the Kelowna uh, Blood Donor Center being opening before we transition to plasma. Um, so I looked into where the closest location would be for you, and it looks like Peachland would be your next best um, donor center that you could go to. So this wouldn't be a like a fixed site that we we pay a lease or rent on it. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact location, but it would be what we call like a mobile blood donation. So it's either at a, a church or a rec hall or a community center where we're just set up for the day. Um, and that would be your next best bet in terms of, um, of donating your blood there. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're interested in it, but I did include just a couple of points on there in terms of why we're moving to plasma um, and, and um, might be of interest to you. So unfortunately right now we're not meeting our needs in terms of the Canadian population for plasma. And plasma can be also um, donated to a patient as well as it can be 
um, created into specialized medicines that help a number of different um, rare and life-threatening diseases and conditions. So we're trying to kind of catch up in terms of uh, where we need to be in terms of our plasma collection. So um, that um, is part of the reason of why we're, we're shifting there. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so just a, a couple more slides and I can open it up again for some questions. Um, so one of the ways, especially with COVID-19 that we're really getting the word out is through technology. And I know many of us have um, started relying more and more on, on our computers and our laptops and our, on our cell phones during this time. And, and we at Canadian Blood Services are as well. Um, so we've asked people to share their stories and why they're donating on, on social media and to tag Canadian Blood Services to help spread the word. So these are just some examples of people who have posted on their social medias and, and reasons for, for donating blood. Um, and if you happen to be savvy on social media and would like to share your story, we always love resharing um, any, any stories that you may have. So um, I've included our Instagram and our Twitter accounts that we have here in, in BC and our Facebook as well. And there's a clone update that I just covered. So some really great questions so far. Is there any other ones for me? Or is there anything else, Liz, that you wanted me to touch on that I didn't um, cover? Oh, I think that was good. Does anyone else have any other? I have a question. Um, you said that, that they have, you have to be 17 to donate. How, what age range does it go to? Can you do, donate until you're in your 90s? Yes, you can, as long as you're healthy okay. to do so. Yeah, you can. We don't, we used Good. to many years ago have an upper age limit, I believe, 81, yes. I believe, but we do not have an upper age limit any longer. Good. Yeah. Was there a caveat to that one that you would have to have donated within a certain time? Um, like Previously, and I'd have to look it up because it, uh but yeah. yes so if you if had you are donated for like 10 years and now you're 90 maybe it won't work out yeah if you're a first-time donor coming in at 90 we would probably we would suggest that you're not just because you don't want to um um for the safety of the donor um not necessarily for your donation but yeah good question i can look up the for sure answer on that too for those of us that are online right now with uh, hemochromatosis, obviously we have uh, a higher iron levels in our bloodstream generally. Is mm -hmm. our blood separated from everybody else's and directed towards a particular group of people like patients with leukemia or whatever may be? And the other thing that I wanted to add for Bruce, I make all my appointments online and off my telephone. I don't even know how to get onto the computer to do it. <laughs> Um, so to answer your first question, no, we do not um, separate your blood donations. There is a rare blood program um, where specific blood types are, are given for yeah. specific patients, but um, people with hemochromatosis are, are not um, part of the rare, rare blood program. As far as I know, you are, your blood is um, uh, separated mm. into the different components like everyone else's in terms of your red blood cells, your platelets, and your plasma. And all three of those components are, are given to patients. Um, and then the white blood cells are discarded, but um, they're not used any differently than a, a regular blood donor. And okay. then your second part about, that's awesome that you booked through calling our one triple eight number. I know. Um, oh no, telephone, um, telephone. Through your telephone. I love that. Um, there's not many people who actually have a, a landline telephone any longer. I so. do. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. No, the app, the app on uh, with Android and with uh, the iPhone is really, really easy to use. And you know, like uh, just adding to Bruce Edwards' question for his son, mm -hmm. that it's quite simple to sign on there and make his appointments, and it'll notify him right when he's due if he hasn't made another appointment. It's fantastic. Thank you. 
Stephanie, I'm wondering if it's too much to ask you to show how you can join our team if you're not already a member of our PFL team. Um, Is it yeah, easy? So it the, yeah, it was the first step that I showed. Um, like to actually join the team, not join yeah. the group boat. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's simplified now, um, Brenda, as Is well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. I can actually, go through this the slide. is good. It's it's great to go over this because I think um, it's great for all of you, not just for yourself, but to let other people know how they can join our team. Um, yeah, that, that would be really great because if they've joined our team, then every time they go on just to to give blood, it will show them if we're doing a group blood donation as well. So that would be great. Yeah. So um, I might have just glossed over this too quickly, um, but what after you have signed in and created an account on, on blood.ca, so those are the two options there, uh, you click on partners either on the left-hand side here or through um, this tab here that says partners for life, join or manage. And then from here, you'll scroll, oops, you'll scroll down and under join an existing team, click on go. And then in this bar here, you'll enter, you don't need that, you can either enter the PFL ID number or if you don't have that handy, I find it's easier to remember the name of your organization. You can enter Canadian hemochromatosis and it will auto populate for you. And then you click on join the team. And this pop-up pop window will come up and um, it won't let you go forward until you've selected it. So this is where it asks you if you want your name and your email to be shared with your champion. Um, a lot of people click no. And I'm wondering if it's they think that we are going to be contacting you. But just to clarify, it would actually be for, for Liz to contact you and so that she knows that you have, in fact, joined uh, your group. Um, but again, you don't have to click on yes. It just um, it helps Liz see who's actually on the team. Um, so you click either yes or no, and then click on join right there. And then it will confirm for you um, that you've joined. So it'll say um, Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. It'll say uh, the champion. Mine says do not allow contact because I was just joining the group as a demonstration. And then you click on view team, and that's where it shows you this page which gives you the overview of your PFL group as well as your, your um, goal or pledge of donations and how many donations have been made so far. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Another question for me. Um, there is one research facility and it's located at near UBC in, in BC here. Mm -hmm. um, and is there any other um, are you thinking about opening another facility in another part of Canada by any chance? I have not heard that myself. Um, so you're right in that we are very lucky in Vancouver and that we have the, the research um, lab here out at UBC. So for those of you that don't know, you if you're not eligible to donate blood, you can come in and, and donate your blood for research out at UBC. Um, but unfortunately, I, I haven't heard. That's not to say that's not on the horizon. It's just not in my, not in my world that I know of. Okay. <laughs> Good question, though, Brenda. Yeah, a lot of people call in and they ask if there's another way they can donate blood. So. Yeah, yeah, and that way it's it's a very similar process of donating blood, except you don't have to answer all those questions about eligibility. So. I thought I could just mention, um, my husband donates blood regularly and he always uses the app and he just thinks that's great and donates that way on his phone, on his computer, whatever, but usually on his phone. So I know it's, well, he thinks it's super easy. So if you want to give that a try, if you get the app or your son for the, for the uh, fellow who had the, the son who wanted to do with the app perhaps. Oh, Thanks Winona. And is your husband part of our Partners for Life team? I, you know, I'm not really sure. He has hemochromatosis as well as myself, but for me, um, I don't, I don't need to donate blood right now. 
whereas he's donating regularly regardless. And he was even before he knew he had hemochromatosis. So that works well for him. Yeah. But I, so I'm not sure. Oh, well, yeah, he's... please ask him because um, that would be great for him to join our team. And yeah. honestly, anybody can join our team, whether you have hemochromatosis or not. It's for um, people who have hemochromatosis and, and friends of people with hemochromatosis to join our team. It's just that um, it all helps us uh, reach our pledge and create more awareness. Okay, I, I'm curious, is what it, when you say it helps reach our pledge, is it just for awareness or is there like a, a monetary um, consequence or, you know, the people donate to the organization or, you know, it's, is there some other uh, benefit? Yeah, no, it's just, um, it's just a fun, like it says our team progress there. It's yep. just kind of, um, I think a philanthropic number, but also for us, when we think about um, the, the power, the strength of our organization is because of how many people are donating and how many people are out there. So we see this number, this pledge number as also a way to create awareness that, you know, people with hemochromatosis are an important part of Canada's lifeline. They right. are an important contributor. Yeah. Okay. So when you were going on, there was there were basically two listed. I wasn't sure if there's one for all of Canada or as chapters added, will there be one for Ridgemont? one said Victoria there and then we would get an Edmonton or wherever you're located how is how is that going to or how is that intended to work I'm not wasn't really sure let me answer that Liz yeah sure okay <laughs> um, we heard talking about they're just working yeah. this all out oh yeah okay. so Liz and I have been talking I don't know this for like the past couple of months about how we want to set up Canadian hemochromatosis society in our in our system kind of behind the scenes as well as what you can see as well. Um, so what the plan is going forward is to have one partners for life um, name and ID so the two you see listed there is the first one is the one to select. Um, the second one is actually one out of Toronto, but it looks like it's actually a. Um, there's only there's not even a member attached to it at this point, so um, it looks like it was just created in our in our system out of our Toronto office. So um, we're gonna um, streamline it and clean it clean it up in the back end and have just one Partners for Life organization. Um, so when you go through to select it, it won't be as confusing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I just when you mentioned about um, using it as a way for teams to get together in a similar location to meet up, then I was thinking, oh, well, then maybe, you know, there would, then you'd need some element uh, that sort of enables that, but mm -hmm. that, that's all I was, I was curious. Well, I think what, what will happen, Winona, that's a good question. What will happen is because when you sign in and the system knows where you live, it will show you if there's a, uh, a group blood donation near you to join. Right, okay. Yeah. You, I and imagine if you're planning anyways, always... you'd have probably some people who just wanna donate when it's convenient and other people who would seek out those opportunities to do it at a, at a time where they could meet up with the other people. So I imagine you probably have both types. Mm -hmm. Exactly, you're exactly right. And that's why too, um, you know, instead of just setting a time for a group blood donation, if if you or other members here want to say, hey, I'm I'm going at this time, we can make it a, a group blood donation and see who else would join. And if you donate on your own and you don't join join a group, your donation still does count towards your team progress. And another thing to note is once you've joined once you don't have to register again. Your donation will continue to count towards your, your Partners for Life organization. So um, that's another great thing. And also if you um, happen to have another organization that you either work for or another like a ball team that you're on and they're also Partners for Life, you can be a part of more than one group at one time too. Okay. Great. Excellent. So any other questions? 
Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for providing this information. And, you know, doing these, these types of online information sessions can be really helpful. Um, we're also going to be doing a train the trainer information session for our um, hemochromatosis information session slides. And so if you're interested in being a presenter uh, like Stephanie and helping to share more information about hemochromatosis, we would welcome you to attend our Train the Trainer session on April 21st. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. Um, but these um, Canadian Blood Services information sessions too, we hope to do them again. So if you have people that might want to have some more information about Canadian Blood Services that uh, we'll do this again and you can invite them to come. Um, yeah, so I think maybe we'll unshare your screen oh, yeah. and then we'll go on gallery that we can all see each other again. And yeah, so that we can see everybody. And does anyone have any parting thoughts or anything that you wanna say before we say good night? Quiet, quiet group. <laughs> And that's totally okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for some of your questions. Thank you for showing up today. Um, great to see you. And thank you, Stephanie, for um, sharing your information with us tonight. Thank you again for having me.